Number 10, stopped a train with his body. In the second Spider-Man film starring Tobey Maguire, Spidey goes through some burnout after losing MJ to John Jameson and having his friendship with Harry Osborn fall apart. During this time, he's lost his spider powers and he gets attacked by Doc Ock. After an intense battle, the mad Doc leaves Spidey to rescue a rogue train heading off of the rails. Pete, having already taken off his mask, puts himself directly in the line of danger and is stretched to the point of nearly breaking in two as he gives everything he's got to stop the train. The effort leaves him battered, bruised, and barely conscious. And in a touching moment, the citizens of New York move him to safety and return his mask, swearing that they won't tell a soul. It's a touching tribute to Spider-Man's sacrifice, and it definitely looks pretty painful. Hey Nerd Squad, if you like these videos and you wanna see more, take a second to hit that like button and ring that notification bell. We really appreciate it. Number 9, got dragged off to fight in another dimension. This version of Peter Parker has it pretty rough. When he was a boy, his parents died in a car crash and his Uncle Ben was highly abusive. In his anger, he adopts the name Charlie Parker instead of Peter. He's a problem child and he spends two years in a juvenile detention center. By age 13, he's living on his own and using his abilities to steal from drug dealers. If that's not bad enough, He's later recruited into the Superior Spider Army, picked up by Ashley Barton, and dragged off to fight in an alternate universe where the Earth is irradiated without so much as an introduction or an explanation. That it's like, let's go, no time to explain. This version of Spidey is pretty grumpy and it's easy to see why. Regular Pete already has a hard time, but this guy got dealt a seriously crappy hand. Still, having spider powers does seem pretty awesome. Number eight got beaten to near death by the Phoenix Four. The Avengers vs. X-Men event was epic and mind-blowing, featuring some crazy showdowns between our favorite heroes. In A vs. X Volume 1 Part 7, Spider-Man plays a big role as he trains with Hope Summers, trying to help her learn how to control the Phoenix Force. As she grows frustrated that the fight is escalating and she hasn't been able to help, Spidey tries to reassure her that her time will come. Ironically, it's Spider-Man's time that comes later, as he covers the escape of his fellow Avengers by distracting those who are controlled by the Phoenix Force. Despite him having no chance, Spidey gets up again and again after he's beaten to a pulp, likely suffering multiple broken bones while rescuing his friends. It's a real display of heroic sacrifice from everyone's favorite wall crawler. Number seven broke Black Cat's nose and heart. Venom wanted everything to do with Spider-Man. He wanted to take away everything, starting of course with his love life. So in Amazing Spider-Man 316, he goes after another close acquaintance, this time it's Black Cat. We see her in a train of thought, wondering where Spider-Man had moved to. How peculiar indeed, I wonder. So she's come to realize that her and the spider should be together. And then now Venom comes in just to ruin her entire day. Venom attacks and figures she must know where he is, although she legitimately doesn't. So before Venom heads out, he casually mentions that Parker's wife didn't know where he was either. Adding insult to injury, literally. She got a broken nose and then he's like, hey, by the way, he's married. So your night just went from good to the opposite. What a terrible night too. Imagine getting your nose broken and then someone's like, hey, by the way, she's married. Number six, turned into a lizard beast and then died. In this universe, it was Gwen Stacy who was bitten and received spider powers and the experience had a profound impact on Peter Parker. Pete idolized Spider Woman and was desperate to be like her. So desperate in fact that he experimented on himself in a scene that goes horribly wrong and he's transformed into a terrible lizard-like creature. He shows up in this form at the Midtown Senior Prom where he does battle against Gwen. After a serious beatdown, Peter returns to his human form but he still dies from his injuries. Being dead has probably got to be one of the worst things that's happened to Peter but it's not as bad as all the suffering that some other versions of Spider-Man go through. Number five, tried to make Spider-Man his heir. If you can't beat him, make them join you. <laughs> that was Norman's thinking in the Revenge of the Green Goblin story anyways. Here, Norman attempts to brainwash Peter Parker into giving in to his dark side and joining the Green Goblin legacy. I guess I should say his green side. Of course, Norman didn't succeed in the end, but for a moment there, it almost seemed like he might. He also put Peter through hell during this whole endeavor, so regardless of whether or not his plan was successful, it was still pretty awful for Peter the whole time. Number 4, Killed by Thanos. Is there anything worse than ceasing to exist? When Thanos performed his legendary snap with the Infinity Gauntlet, literally half the universe was wiped away, but I was too busy worrying about Spidey to even comprehend the destruction. Seeing Spider-Man disappear like dust on the big screen was seriously heart-wrenching for a lot of people. 
but it also spawned a generation of hilarious memes, perfectly balanced as all things should be. Luckily for us, these events are undone eventually, but man, there's nothing like seeing Spider-Man die to sober you up. Number three. Lee Price. When Venom bonds to a host, depending on who that person is, things could be manageable. Like Eddie Brock, for example, things are manageable, it's kind of workable, but sometimes they can be even worse than before, like in the case of Lee Price. Lee had a pretty rough time growing up. He was bullied and his father wasn't the best role model by any way, and he treated his mother in an awful way as well. Just not a great guy, not a great house. So in order to escape this horrid living situation, Lee thought it best to burn down the apartment, all while his parents were still in there. Like I said, not a nice guy. And to get away with it, he blamed it all on a mutant with pyrokinesis, who at the time was his friend. So Lee suppressed this for years, and he grew up actually believing that the boy had actually done this. And he also thought that his dad had abandoned him the whole time. That's how far his brain has gone believing this. Later in life, he spent five years as a ward of the state before joining the army, until an explosion resulted in the loss of a couple squad members and a couple of fingers. Already a tough life, now enter Venom. You know it's bad when even Venom is trying to unbond with you. That's how you know. Lee used the symbiote for awful things, so much so that Venom was actually relieved once Lee had left the picture. Number two, been the last person alive on Earth. This version of Spider-Man is actually Ben Parker, in an alternate reality where he received spider powers when he accompanied his nephew Peter to a science demonstration and was bitten by a radioactive spider. Ben decided to use his powers to help others, but retired after his nemesis, the Emerald Elf, discovered his identity and killed his wife and Peter. Later on in life, Ben is approached by Ezekiel Sims who warns him of the imminent arrival of Morlun, devourer of totems, on a mission to destroy all spider folk. Ezekiel allows Ben to hide in his bunker under Sim's tower, and while he's there, the whole city of New York and presumably the world is subjected to nuclear destruction. He only emerges from the bunker later when the other spider totems arrive in the universe to enlist his help. He is reminded by the OG Spider-Man of his own advice about great responsibility and he suits up one last time to help the spider army. It must have been really lonely just sitting around in that bunker though. Damn. And here we are at number one. Turned into a zombie and ate Mary Jane and Aunt May. This one is just seriously messed up. So in this story, a zombie virus is infecting heroes like Luke Cage and Hawkeye and eventually Spider-Man as well. After being bitten by Colonel America, Spidey takes a punch that dislocates his jaw and then in this fight realizes the level of destruction happening all across the city. He realizes in the moment he's gonna have to go save Mary Jane and Aunt May so he just bails, swings off to go and save them ASAP. Unfortunately, he does show up a little too late and the zombie virus is already working its way through his body. When MJ approaches, he lashes out and bites her and as she turns into a zombie, Pete sets to work on Aunt May. Ultimately, we are treated to this horrifying scene in which Spidey holds up Aunt May's severed head and screams at it. Yeesh. Number 10, reshaped the universe. This one only gets ranked lower because it comes to us from the alternate reality of a What If comic. In this What If story, Norman Osborn gets his hands on the Infinity Gauntlet and uses it to reshape reality, all to impress his daddy. What's even more awful is when his father confesses that he actually loves him. Norman then can't even bring himself to believe his father's acceptance and in the end destroys his father, thereby destroying himself in the process. So this was in a weird way not just a bad thing he did to reality, but also did to his own self which I guess would be a good thing for reality. Definitely be a good thing for Spider-Man. And at number 10, Organic Webs. Tobey Maguire's iteration of Spider-Man was extremely accurate to the comic source material, but one of the few differences between the two was his version of Spider-Man's web shooters. For most of Spider-Man's nearly 60 years of existence in comic books and various adaptations, the superhero used a pair of wrist-mounted shooters that shoot a synthetic web-like fluid. While most Spider-Man adaptations retain the iconic mechanical web shooters, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy opted to give its version of Peter Parker the power to generate webbing from his body. When you really think about it, it is really gross. It was even a joke made in the latest Spider-Man movie when the Andrew Garfield and Tom Holland versions of the characters are flabbergasted and slightly grossed out by Tobey Maguire's organic sticky spider webbing that came propelling out of this weird scar on his wrist. Maybe I'm weird, but I kind of like the organic webbing, I don't know, maybe because I grew up on the Raimi films, it felt right, and the reason for Raimi doing it makes sense to me, I'm sorry. Number 9, from rags to riches and 
Back to rags again. One of the weirdest things that happened to Peter in regards to no one seemingly really acknowledging or remembering it much in the continuity is when Peter became basically a globe-trotting billionaire all his own, in a similar but distinctly different style to Iron Man's Tony Stark. Well, of course, initially it was Otto and Peter's body who created Parker Industries and made it a success, but still, even without Otto in the driver's seat, it makes sense when you think about it as Peter is a brilliant man who, if he had the time and you know, be put in the effort, could easily end up near the top of the Fortune 500. However, what is weird is that he created a global company that was extremely profitable and successful for a time, lost it, and then everyone seemingly forgot who he was. He ended up back as just poor Peter Parker, just trying to get by while playing the role of hero. And everyday folks don't seem to even recognize him as the face of a once great global company. That's pretty nuts. Number eight, getting beat up by the spot. Jonathan Owen is a villain that only well-versed fans of Spider-Man would recognize, probably. As the spot, Jonathan hasn't always been the most relevant villain of Peter Parker. He often ends up on the list of Spider-Man's worst and unknown villains. I mean, I mean, when he first confronted Spider-Man and announced his villain moniker in Peter Parker the Spectacular Spider-Man Volume 1 Issue 99 in 1985, the hero hit the ground laughing, which made it all the more embarrassing for Spider-Man when the Spot actually defeated him. Spot threw Peter in and out of his dimensions using his whole portals. He landed more than a few good punches on the hero as well. The Spot doesn't hit hard, but as he says, even the strongest of trees can be felled by sufficient strokes from even the smallest of hatchets. Yeah, he said that. Eventually, he left Peter discombobulated with Black Cat having to help him back to his feet. And he got his own back eventually, but that's not important. Coming in at number seven, we have the time Spider-Man had to take on the entire Sinister Six at once in the PlayStation 4 Spider-Man video game. After a breakout at the supervillain prison, The Raft, Peter is faced with his worst nightmare when he's surrounded by the combined team of the Rhino, the Vulture, Scorpion, Electro, and Mr. Negative, who are more than enough to weaken Spider-Man before the arrival of the leader of the Sinister Six, Dr. Octopus, who up until this point had been a friend and mentor to this universe's Peter Parker. The betrayal cuts Peter deep and his wounded body is thrown into New York Harbor, only barely surviving by holding on to a floating oil drum. This beatdown was so bad, Peter eventually needed a specialized costume to be strong enough to go up against Doc Ock once more. Number six, Spider-Man and Silk getting busy on the ceiling. Cindy Moon, first revealed in The Amazing Spider-Man number one from 2014, was a girl who on the same day was also bitten by the exact same spider that gave Peter Parker his powers. Now fast forward to the fourth issue of that comic and Peter learns of her existence and the place she was being kept safe. He releases her and joins her as she goes off into the world. Now it took about five or six pages before it was revealed that these two young spider heroes release pheromones that make them irresistibly attracted to one another and they nearly immediately start going at it. Mid argument. They go at it so much so that it carries on into the next issue when he and Cindy Moon are on the ceiling of the apartment that Peter shares with his roommate Anna Maria Marconi. So of course Anna Maria walks in on the two spider freaks sparsely clothed and unable to control themselves. Not an ideal situation. Number five, the wrath of the SRA. Spider-Man not only impressively survived unmasking for his pal Tony Stark during the events of Civil War, but he also managed to survive betraying Tony as well. When Spider-Man got a good look at the camp Stark's side of the war were running, he realized that he had made the wrong choice and attempted to walk out. Iron Man, however, isn't ready to let Peter go and attempts to stop him. He tries to tell S.H.I.E.L.D. to just bring Spider-Man in quietly as all Tony wants to do is talk to him. He doesn't want to fight, but S.H.I.E.L.D. under the Superhuman Registration Act denies Stark's request and attempts to have Spider-Man apprehended and arrested, sending the top secret Thunderbolts team that they have amassed after Spider-Man. They send Jack-O-Lantern and Jester the Third, and if it weren't for the interference of Punisher, he may have ended up dead at their hands. Well, S.H.I.E.L.D. was ready to rein in their team members when it came to how much force they were using, but still, they already kind of almost killed Spider-Man at that point, putting him in critical condition by the time Punisher showed up to save him. You can see the fight and the shape that Peter is in by the end of it in issue number five of the first Civil War series. Number four, Miles getting Gwen's hair stuck on his hand. If you haven't seen the totally awesome 
awesome and award-winning animated Into the Spider-Verse film? Well, pause this video and go do that and then come back. But if you have, then you surely remember the scene not too long after Miles Morales discovers he has powers and winds up in an extremely embarrassing situation with Gwen Stacy, his crush. You see, Miles' uncle told him to try this totally slick move on his crush where he puts his hand on her shoulder and be like, hey. Which, I don't know where you go after you say the hey thing, it kind of feels like terrible advice and I think it was because Miles just did it in the middle of a conversation and made it really bad. But then, thanks to his new powers, when he goes to remove his hand, he accidentally gets stuck to her hair. The next 30 seconds sees him accidentally pull her in close, get stuck to her textbook, spin around, blame it on puberty, and then get catapulted by her, all in front of other students. She ends up getting half her hair buzzed off, which Hey, it's an experience neither of them will forget. Maybe when they're married, they'll laugh about it. I don't know, maybe not. Coming in at number three, we have the time that Deadpool accidentally killed and then resurrected Spider-Man twice. After a complicated series of events led to Deadpool being hired to kill his friend Spider-Man and being convinced that Peter had turned to evil, the merc with a mouth shot Peter Parker in the head unexpectedly at his apartment. This would be a pretty anticlimactic end to the spectacular Spider-Man, however, and Deadpool eventually convinced his demon girlfriend of the time to resurrect his buddy, because comic books are weird like that. In a comedic twist, Deadpool would shoot Peter again after briefly thinking that he had once more turned to evil, but eventually everyone wound up alive and safe even if this would continue to be one of the weirdest situations in Spider-Man's very weird history. Number two, spider web underwear. In The Amazing Spider-Man from 2014, after Spider-Man had a bit of a body swap with a certain villain, he got into a fight that had all of his costume, minus his mask, zapped off, like all of it, down to his birthday suit. As a quick solution to the problem, Spider-Man decided to use his webbing to cover up his privates as an honestly genius decision. Well, it would have been genius, but see, Peter didn't realize that the villain he mind swapped with actually improved his webbing so it now lasts much longer, which meant Peter now had some permanent underwear for a while. So not only did Spider-Man have a costume consisting of a mask and web undies, that was seen all over live television, prompting many characters to laugh at him, and even gave Jessica drew a clue that this was Peter Parker back in his body again, he also had to explain this whole thing in one long monologue to Captain America of all people. Oh, Peter, you never cease to amaze. Number one, trapped in Dr. Octopus's mind. At one point in the comics, we get the awesome weirdness that is Superior Spider-Man, which is basically when Otto Octavius, aka Dr. Octopus, takes hold of Spider-Man's body. However, this happens as the result of a body swap, which Peter is tricked into, which means that Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man, has his consciousness end up in the failing body of Otto Octavius, who at that time was dying. While trapped in Otto's mind, Peter ends up reliving some of of Otto's memories, namely an extremely intimate and weirdly romantic moment that happened between Otto and Aunt May when the two were engaged to be married. Although they never ended up married, apparently they still sealed the deal, if you know what I mean. Which means that Peter got a front row seat to an intimate interaction that he'd rather have never known happened. And, you know, he's in Otto's body in that memory, so. Number 10, Unmasking. During the events of Civil War, Spider-Man ultimately decided to side with Iron Man and, to prove how loyal he was to the cause, he even decided to publicly unmask to show just how much he believed in his friend Tony Stark and the idea of the Superhuman Registration Act. However, this turned out to be the wrong choice for Peter in the end. Not only was his life at risk as a result of his choice and as a result of ultimately changing his mind, but also the lives of those he loved were threatened as well. Peter Parker almost ended up being shot to death at the behest of Kingpin, who put a hit out on him, and as a result of surviving that, being nearly missed, Aunt May instead ended up taking a bullet and almost lost her life, being put into intensive care. Peter Parker would also end up losing his marriage after he and Mary Jane made a deal with Mephisto in order to save Aunt May's life. So really, it's pretty impressive that Peter managed to survive this whole overall fairly awful ordeal, both when it comes to keeping his life and keeping his sanity. Number 9. Witnessing Aunt May's 
romance. During a time where Peter swapped bodies with Dr. Octopus, he found himself trapped in his body and in Dr. Oct's mind. Because of this, Peter ended up forced to watch a memory that Otto had of a night of passion with Peter's own Aunt May before their almost wedding at the time. Sure, Peter has survived a lot of physical beatings and extremely devastating disasters, but the emotional trauma of this one? I do not know how he did it. Peter obviously did not want to see this, and yet he was forced to. And still afterward, he manages to be able to look both Otto and Aunt May in the eye when he needs to. I do not know how though. Not only did Peter survive this, by the way, but also survived witnessing all the beatings from Otto's perspective that he, as Spider-Man, had given him via Otto's memories. That is some mental and emotional durability right there. Although I guess this version of Peter kind of died as he only managed to survive via his subconscious after this. Here's hoping he managed to forget this at least somehow. Maybe because only his subconscious kind of survived, his consciousness of this is like boop, gone. I hope so. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want to learn about some more crazy things that Spider-Man has survived, there's lots out there, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8. Electrocuted and Thrown from a Skyscraper During the events of Marvel Knights Spider-Man, as early as the third issue in, Spider-Man gets badly beaten and ends up in such a bad way that he is rushed to the ER. This all happens after Aunt May has seemingly been kidnapped. In this much darker take on Spider-Man's world is written by Mark Miller, Spider-Man confronts Electro and the Vulture, suspecting they may have been involved. During this fight, Spider-Man gets badly electrocuted more than once by Electro. In fact, at one point he is so severely and dramatically electrocuted that he ends up being flinged from a skyscraper and plummets to the ground, before he can recover enough to even shoot a web and swing to safety. Instead, he smashes all the way down and through a cab, knocked unconscious and badly injured. The paramedics then rush him to the hospital. That is how severely Electro injured him. Of course, this is Spider-Man and somehow, miraculously, he manages to survive, but whew, it was definitely a close call. Number 7. Everyone Loves MJ An awkward moment in the Ultimate Spider-Man universe comes courtesy of Ultimate Peter Parker getting his own version of the Clone Saga. Except here, instead of Ben Riley and Kane Parker, we got Kane Parker and Jessica Drew. That's right, in the Ultimate universe, Jessica Drew is actually a female female clone of Peter Parker. There were some other clones too, just for those of you that are like, you didn't mention all the other clones. But yes, I know about them. <laughs> they exist. And even more intriguing and also kind of sad in this reality, Jessica and all the other clones have all of Peter's memories, which leads to pretty much all of them having a huge crush on MJ. Jessica included. Although in an even stranger twist, despite also being in love with Mary Jane or seemingly being in love with Mary Jane, instead of Jessica ending up as a lesbian in this portrayal of her character as a result of sharing Peter's memories and feelings, it is implied that she actually ends up dating Johnny Storm, albeit possibly briefly. Although I think that also could say something about the potential for the close relationship that Johnny and Peter have in the comics, so maybe that's what that's about. Number 6. Missile explosion. During issues 523 and 524 of The Amazing Spider-Man, we learn that Spider-Man managed to survive the explosion of a massive missile that was filled with toxins. Not only did we see Peter survive the explosion, but he also survived the fallout after being saved by Iron Man. Stark secured Peter and took him back to the Avengers Mansion as quickly as possible so that he could treat him for the toxins he had been exposed to and his injuries. Fortunately, Peter is so durable with such a tough immune system apparently that he was able to fight off most of the effects until Stark managed to treat him. And in so doing, Stark saved his life. It's pretty convenient. He also happened to arrive at just the right time as Peter was also about to fall at terminal velocity into the ocean, the impact of which could have killed him. Quite lucky that he's so tough and that Iron Man arrived in the nick of time. That all worked out pretty well. Coming in at number five, we have the time Peter Parker became a literal spider monster. We've already covered a storyline on this list where Peter grew some extra limbs, but during an event in which the concept of the spider totems was first introduced into the Marvel mythology, Peter Parker found himself transformed into a gigantic spider-human hybrid, with horrifying mandibles and a hunger for human flesh. Eventually, this creature would appear to die and then be reborn as a fresh Peter Parker, now possessing organic web shooters. 
While this may have just been a really convoluted storyline to make Spidey's web status the same as the Tobey Maguire movies, it's still a body horror storyline that makes my skin crawl. Number four, beat down by Morlin. During the story The Other, Peter seemed to be suffering from and ultimately dying of a mysterious illness. While struggling with this, Moreland decided to pay Spider-Man a visit just to basically torment him. Focused on his potential impending death, Spider-Man is caught unawares when Moreland attacks him while he's swinging around the city, attempting to clear his mind. The two have an insanely explosive fight, but just as Peter thinks he has the upper hand, Moreland brutally defeats him. He plucks out Spider-Man's eye and eats it, and then beats him to within an inch of his life. Spider-Man manages to survive this attack despite him losing an eye and being beaten to a pulp by Morlan. Number 3. Spider-Man Loses Control One of the most awkward moments in terms of just what went down has to be when Spider-Man accidentally hits MJ when she's trying to get between Peter and his clone Ben Riley to stop them from fighting one another. Oddly enough, I was remembering a thing where this also appeared. Even though this moment was very different in terms of what caused it to happen, a very similar incident and also is incorporated into the original Sam Raimi Spider-Man film franchise. In this case, MJ tries to stop Peter from beating up on a bouncer at the nightclub that she works at. In the comics, Peter and Ben both go to run some tests to figure out who is the clone and who is the original between them when Peter learns that Ben is supposedly the original and he freaks out. He begins wailing on Ben and Mary Jane breaks free to attempt to break up the fight, calling out to her husband, stop it Peter, for the love of God, stop, you're killing him. Instinctively, Peter Peter goes to push MJ back, telling her to get away and leave him alone. And he strikes her, sending her flying with his super strength, only for him to realize what he's done almost immediately, condemning his own behavior before running away. In Spider-Man 3, it goes down similarly, with Peter running away, even following this encounter, and MJ calling out Peter, stop it, which is also very similar. Number 2, Body Failure Another time that Peter Parker died, it was actually as Dr. Otto Octavius. During the time time of Superior Spider-Man, Otto got a hold of Peter's body by tricking him into a body swap. With Peter's consciousness stuck in Otto's old failing body, when it died, so seemingly did Spider-Man. I mean, we still have Peter's body, but for now, Otto was the one behind the steering wheel. Fortunately, while Peter did kind of die, he also managed to survive as Otto was unable to wipe Peter's complete consciousness clean from his own body, and his subconscious kind of lingered there. In the end, Otto gave up his own hold over Spider-Man's body in order to let Peter Parker reclaim his his body and his mantle once more. Otto was compelled to do this when he realized that even with all that he had done, he could never truly be a better Spider-Man than Peter because he was kind of missing the moral compass, which was part of what truly made Peter Parker superior. Also, he needed Peter's help because he was like, I'm trying to save the woman I love and it's like impossible, please. I need the real Spider-Man help. Number one, annihilation of his universe. Miles Morales didn't just survive the death or a bad beatdown, but actually managed to survive the destruction of his entire universe. Following the events of Secret Wars and the creation and dissolution of Emperor Doom's battle world, Miles Morales somehow managed to survive after his entire reality of Earth 1610 was pretty much completely destroyed. How? Well, Miles Morales' Spider-Man managed to earn a new life for his family and himself on the reinstated reality of Earth 616, all because of an act of kindness in combination with a weird quirk. Molecule Man had been asking for a snack, and Miles happened to have a burger in the pocket of his suit, which he gave him. As a result, Molecule Man decided to make sure when the universe was recreated, using his powers, that Miles and his family had a place in it. How nice. He also gave Miles' uncle Aaron Davis a new lease on life in the Earth 616 reality as well. Pretty sure he also brought his mom back to life too. Earth 1610 has returned since its destruction, and one of its other survivors, the Maker, even managed to return to it. But at the time, it wasn't around. So, still pretty cool that Miles survived that. Coming in at number 10, we have the time Peter grew and then lost four additional arms, literally making him an eight-limbed freak. This event took place during a period of time in which being Spider-Man had brought Peter nothing but pain, with Gwen Stacy's father having recently passed away, and Gwen believing Spider-Man to be responsible. Thus, Peter decided to get rid of his double life by developing a serum to remove his spider abilities. 
Unfortunately, testing serums on yourself rarely works out in the Marvel Universe, and Peter's spider powers are amplified to the point that four additional arms burst forth out of his body. And while Spider-Man would eventually be able to balance out his life and lose the additional limbs, it's still a bizarre tale of body horror that Peter is lucky to have gotten out of unscathed. Coming in at number 9, we have getting trampled by the rhino in the video game Spider-Man Miles Morales. This game is one of my favorites of the last couple years, and it opens with both Peter Parker and Miles Morales working together as Spider-Men to try and transport the rhino safely to the supervillain prison. Unfortunately, the rhino breaks free, and the opening tutorial of the game is trying to chase the villain down and stop his rampage. Unfortunately, since this is just the tutorial, Peter Parker does most of the fighting and winds up getting his butt kicked, getting hit with attacks that should definitely have shattered at least half the bones in his body. Luckily, Miles is eventually able to save the day by discovering his Venom Blast ability, but it's still a wonder how Spidey is able to even stand after all of that pummeling. Coming in at number 8, we have Firebrand burning Peter Parker alive. During another period where Spider-Man was a bit off his game, he got into a fight with the usually low-level villain Firebrand. Unfortunately, Spider-Man's taunts during the fight pushed Firebrand over the edge, causing him to fully unleash his power and blow up a city block. The resulting explosion was shown in graphic detail to burn both Peter's costume and his flesh, and the only reason he was able to survive without permanent scarring was due to the quick intervention of a hospital that usually only treats supervillains. I guess one perk of getting most of your face burnt off is that the doctors won't know exactly who they're healing. Nicely handled, Spider-Man. Number 7, Sinister War. Sinister War also really scrambled Spider-Man up. I mean, what's worse than one team of six sinister villains? How about a whole bunch of Sinister Six teams? Which is exactly the trial that Peter faced during Sinister War. Pretty much all of the villains he came up against seemed to also want Spider-Man for one reason or another. And while some fought to actually protect Spidey, many more were fighting to harm, capture, or perhaps even kill him. Needless to say, it was one long night for Spider-Man, with him dealing with fight after fight to the point that he couldn't even catch his breath. Coming in at number 6, we have the time that Spider-Man was tortured by the dark ancient sorcerer Kulan Goth. During a comic event that saw the entire city of Manhattan transformed into an alternate medieval fantasy version, Spider-Man was one of the few heroes who remembered the world as it truly was. As punishment for rebelling against Kulan Goth's rule, this version of Spider-Man was tortured and put on display for all of Kulan Goth's enemies to see. And while Spider-Man would eventually be restored once Kulan Goth was defeated and reality reverted back to normal, it's still incredibly disturbing to see one of Marvel's greatest heroes being put in such a violent situation. Number 5, Aunt May Forgets to Knock. Speaking on people walking in on people. Later on in their comic book history, MJ and Peter wouldn't just be friends or even dating, they would actually end up married for quite a long while. However, just because they were married didn't mean that Aunt May always remembered to respect their privacy and knock when they were alone together in a bedroom. Case in point in Web of Spider-Man issue number 50 when she decides to bring them up some warm hot cocoa to warm their bones on a cold winter's night, only to find out that they are already busy warming their bones. Coming in at number 4, we have the time that Spider- Spider-Man lifted an entire building and lived to tell the tale. In one of the most iconic, defining moments for the entire character, Spider-Man found himself trapped under the rubble of a collapsed building, with water rapidly filling the area as well. In order to save the life of his Aunt May, Peter had to lift the weight of the entire building off of his back. This is the pivotal moment where Spider-Man showed just how strong he could be when the situation called for it, and just how far he was willing to push his body to save the lives of the people he loves. Something that would go on to become a defining feature of the character. But seriously, Peter, you should probably get someone to spot you the next time you lift something that heavy. Number three, 
killed by Craven. In reality, Craven never really killed Peter, although we were meant to believe that he had killed Spider Man. I mean, it definitely looked like he'd killed Spider Man. Craven at one point sets out in Craven's last hunt to beat Spider Man by replacing him and proving that he is better than Spider Man is. However, in the end, he begins to question if he's truly beaten Spider Man. And, you know, who actually makes a better spider? He realizes that there is no one quite like Peter Parker when it comes to being Spider Man, just as Spider Man himself seemingly returns from the dead. In truth, Craven had merely administered a drug that had made Peter seem dead, probably slowing his heart rate, definitely making him trip out, and putting him in a stasis for a few weeks. Spider Man, however, was buried alive by Craven and wakes up in his grave. Pretty sure he was also shot point blank by Craven, but anyways. Spider Man then has to dig his way out and find his way back to the villain for that final confrontation. The story ends with Craven taking his own life, believing he had finally accomplished everything in his life that he had set out to do. But don't worry, Craven would come back because Craven. Coming in at number two, we have the so called death of the ultimate Spider Man. In the comic book event that would lead to the debut of Miles Morales, the Peter Parker of the Ultimate Marvel Universe had to die before a new Spider-Man could rise. In a final battle against his nemesis, the Green Goblin, the teenage Peter Parker protected his family against Norman Osborn's relentless and crazed attacks even after he'd already been mortally wounded by an assassin's bullet. While at the time this seemed like a tragic and dramatic end to the ultimate Peter Parker, it would eventually be revealed that he actually survived this intense battle, as the Oz formula that gave him his spider abilities also functionally made this Peter Parker immortal. Maybe it's just a weird comic book retcon, but the fact that Peter survived so many injuries is truly mind-blowing, and I can't wait to see where the Ultimate Universe takes us next. And finally, coming in at our top spot, we have Spider-Man's head-crushing defeat in the original Infinity Gauntlet event. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we may have all gotten our hearts broken by that classic, I don't want to go, Mr. Stark, but the battle for the Infinity Gauntlet in the comics may have been even more brutal to Peter Parker than we'd ever want to see on the big screen. In the comics, Peter is able to briefly get the upper hand on Thanos with some web attacks to the face, but is then viciously beaten eaten by Thanos' lady companion, Taraxia, who is shown to kill the wall crawler by attacking him with a rock. Pretty brutal for a cosmic Marvel event. And while by the end of Infinity Gauntlet all of the killed heroes would be restored, this might just be one of the most bone-crushing losses ever suffered by Spider-Man. Number 9. Cheated we find out about this one in Red Goblin, Red Death. And what's worse, it's a story that in the present day of that comic has a pretty gruesome ending. Here, Norman runs into an old Empire University pal, if you could call him that. Ned Tobolowski was someone Norman knew in school, and it's implied that at least they were friends or at least acquaintances, before Ned spilled the beans about a cheating apparatus that Norman was using and had built. Ned's big mouth almost cost Norman his schooling. He lost his scholarship and was almost expelled, like these close. Honestly, if he created a cheating machine though, he probably should have been expelled in my opinion. Like, I don't know how they let him continue going to school after that. Norman gets Ned back though when Ned stops him on the street years later while he is Red Goblin not a good time. So true, what happens to Ned at least wasn't necessarily Green Goblin's doing, but I'm gonna count this anyways because one, this thing happened way in his past, and two, this list is more centered around Osborn as Goblin as opposed to like any specific Goblin identity. It's called Green Goblin, but I'm approaching it as like a Norman Osborn list. I know we've seen others wear that mantle as well, but I think Norman by far is one of the most dastardly goblins out there, red, green, or otherwise. Number eight, Framed Spider-Man. If you think J. Jonah Jameson is bad, wait till you see what happens when Osborn takes over control of the Daily Bugle. At one point, Norman Osborn tries to use the paper himself to drag Spider-Man's name through the mud after buying it and then blackmailing Jameson into giving him full control over the paper and what gets published there. He then frames Spider-Man Spider-Man for murder, making it look like his webbing basically caused someone to 
die by asphyxiation and puts a bounty on Spider-Man's head, starting off the Spider Hunt story arc. Of course, Peter finds a way out of all of this trouble and makes sure that Norman gets his in the end, but he still has to suffer through everyone hunting him down and believing that he was a killer, so still, it's pretty terrible. And before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder to give this video a thumbs up if you love Norman as much as we do. Love, hate. Number seven, became a heartless killer and died. Introduced in What If Spider-Man vs. Wolverine in 2008, Assassin Spider-Man is a serious dude. This version of Spidey becomes an assassin that works alongside Wolverine which sounds super awesome and not like one of the worst things to ever happen to him. However, he eventually becomes kind of jaded with no qualms about killing and just doing whatever it takes to get the job done. Worse still, this version of Pete doesn't even make any quips or crack jokes like the Spidey we know and love. He literally has a gun in his web shooters. He is eventually recruited into the spider army, but later he tragically dies. Still not the worst thing to happen to Spider-Man. Number six, drove Harry insane. I mean, I don't think we can blame Norman for all of Harry's villainous actions, but we can definitely blame him, I think, for most of them. As of late, Harry has resurfaced as the villain known as Kindred, twisted into some combination of Harry's soul combined with that of a demon. This even darker version of Harry blames both Peter and his father for everything that went wrong in his life, and comes back to hold them both accountable and make them Hey, I guess you could also look at it in the way that Norman and Peter share the blame here for Harry's psyche cracking. As in loving both of them and then discovering their true identities, it created great conflict in him, causing him to turn on Spider-Man and later also to resent his father and his role as Green Goblin. And kind of his legacy, really, because he also, you know, kind of gets that crazy from his dad, just saying. Number five ditch the gear. Sometimes when you don't need something anymore, you drop it like it's hot. Like that scene from Forrest Gump where Forrest runs out of his leg braces. But now sometimes when you realize you don't need something and you get rid of it, sometimes you just happen to be Venom. And sometimes that thing you no longer need is Angelo Fortunato. So back in 2005, Marvel wanted to reboot Venom. So the new Venom host was Don Fortunato after he won the symbiote in an auction. What a great win, by the way. I would definitely bet on that. He gave the suit to his son Angelo to make him more tough. Okay, sure, it works. Hey, trust me, man, it works. Eddie warns him about the risks, but Angelo didn't listen. Angelo attacked Spider-Man and ripped out his heart only to discover that it was just an imposter. And then after a fight with Spider-Man, Angelo just left out of fear. He was getting his butt kicked. He wanted nothing to do with it. And Venom wasn't a fan of that. So he left the host mid-air. Mid-air, he just dropped. Dropped him like a top. But his gear wasn't working properly after the fight Angelo had just caused. So how unfortunate is that? Number four, kill JJ. That's right, while in main continuity, JJ would end up being blackmailed by Norman Osborn, in the Ultimate Universe, he would end up being murdered by him. I know, so crazy. Especially considering that Jameson thought he had actually shot Norman dead and was in the middle of panicking over the fact. Norman, however, surprised him by getting up and transforming into his goblin self, revealing that in this universe, he was a mortal green goblin. Yep, before we had the Immortal Hulk series, Series, we had this. Number three, became one of the four horsemen of Apocalypse. This has actually happened to Spider-Man on two different occasions. Once in Cable and Deadpool number 15 in 2005, and then again in Avengers volume four. In these two stories, Apocalypse unleashes his master plan for world domination, which includes recruiting four people he finds fit to be his horsemen of the apocalypse. The 2010 version is especially horrifying, with Spidey being horribly mutated into this hairy white beast seemingly fused to a horse-like creature that looks like it's made of webbing. Being used by evil bad guys is bad enough, but being turned into a hideous monster for that is definitely not Spider-Man's finest hour. Number two, killed Gwen Stacy. We all know this one to be one of the worst things that Norman as the Green Goblin has done. So I don't think it's a surprise that this one is high up on our list. One of the worst, not just from Peter's perspective, by the way, but also from fans' perspectives. Many still believe that Gwen was actually the one destined to be with Peter and in fact, 
fact that she would be a better match for him than Mary Jane herself. I personally love MJ and Peter together, and I like to think of Gwen's death as a what if that can only really ever theoretically be answered if she like lived. Still, even just from Spider-Man's perspective, this has to be one of the most dastardly deeds his foe has ever committed, as Peter Parker for years has also still blamed himself for Gwen's demise, making this wound just that much more tender and that much more deep. This Green Goblin did it, but then Peter still blamed himself. Rough. Number one, had children with Gwen Stacy. It was really hard for me to try and reason which of these last few points was really the worst, because they're all really bad, especially these last two, killing Gwen or having children with her. Which one is worse? In the end, however, considering that he later kills her, I figured this one took the cake. Yep, as if Norman Osborn wasn't diabolical and creepy enough in the comics, we had to retcon in something even more nauseating for him. Enter Sin's past. Here it's retconned in that Norman and Gwen slept together and as if that wasn't bad enough he got her pregnant she gave birth to twins in secrecy in Europe who would be raised by Norman to think that spider-man was their father and that it was he who had killed their mother I'm not sure if it gets any worse than that but if it does I don't think I want to find out how it gets worse number 10 a healthy diet what makes a deadly space goop even more terrifying? Well, let's start with its choice of meal. Us. He likes to eat us and our brains. In The Amazing Spider-Man issue 333, Venom said to Spider-Man, we want to eat your brain. Now, him just saying that to you must be intimidating enough, let alone actually doing it, which we see in Venom The Hunger issue one. He even surprises himself too when it goes from just being a threat to an actual thing that happens. The symbiote needs to feast on brains, not just because it's yummy and fun, but because of a certain chemical found in the brain instead. Eddie isn't a big fan of this throughout the comics and often prevents it from happening by giving Venom chocolate instead. In my opinion, that's a really good solution. Offer anybody chocolate instead of anything, they'll probably take it. Because chocolate contained the same chemical, so it worked. It was a nice tasty substitute. Until eventually writers just stopped including the need for human brains for a meal altogether, which is great. Let's just do more of that. Less eating brains. And before we head over to number nine, if you guys could go ahead and give us a thumbs up down below, that would be great. You guys are the best. Thank you so much for watching. Now back to our list. Number nine pushed Peter Parker. Now, when I say he pushed Peter Parker, you might be thinking, okay, well, so what? This guy just backflips off the Empire State Building for fun. So what's a push really gonna do to this guy? Well, this was an issue because Peter Parker's spider sense didn't go off, which he found troubling. It should have went off, it's danger, why didn't they tell him? Now do keep in mind, this is before Venom made his big comic book debut in Amazing Spider-Man 300. So his ability to block his spider sense was still a mystery. So Peter luckily saved himself with his reflexes and good Samaritans to help him out off the tracks. But Venom was trying to get rid of Peter long before he was slurping up bad guy brains. Now the fact that he didn't say anything catchy or announce this big plan, any villain monologue, makes it more realistic and pretty scary. Number eight, Mary Jane Trauma. Back in his first comic book appearance in 1988, one of the first things Venom did was introduce himself to Mary Jane in the next issue. In this moment, she can't even remember her name. She knows almost nothing because her mind has been harshly numbed while she's cruelly drowned in this onrushing tide of primal fear. That's what the comic says, that's how they described it. And these emotions may never fully fade away. And it's all thanks to Venom. She's so beyond scared that when Peter walks in with the black suit on, she thinks that it's Venom for a brief second. Venom even says that although it wasn't their target, shaking her up could still work. Yeah, for sure, let's just terrify some people and ruin their lives just because. Awesome. Therapy not included. Number seven, transformed Carly Cooper. And not in a good way. While under the mantle of Goblin King, Norman sought information from Carly on the true identity of Superior Spider-Man. He had her kidnapped. And when she refused to give up the information, she refused. He decided to recruit her into his Goblin army. Exposing her to the Goblin formula, he turned Carly into one of his own deranged minions. And for a time, she served him under the mantle of Monster. She would eventually be returned to her former self, but this experience would leave its mark, changing Carly forever. Immediately after her recovery, she also cut Peter Parker and Spider-Man out of her life and moved from New York to New Orleans. Though she would come back. She would get over it, but it was still pretty terrible. Number six, leave a trail. When Eddie Brock was doing time at Rikers Island, his cellmate just happened to be Cletus Cassidy, who was in there for 
let's just say some horrible things. So when Venom came and reunited there with Eddie, part of the symbiote was left behind as they were breaking out, taking over Cletus Cassidy. This guy was horrible beforehand. I mean, he was in there because he took out tons of tons of guys and he bragged about it the entire time. He's sick. So that plus the symbiote equals Carnage. Making its first debut in Amazing Spider-Man 361, Carnage Part 1. He's one of the biggest, baddest villains in the comic, and I'm actually looking forward to seeing Woody Harrelson play him in the live action Venom sequel. Now, while most of this can be pinned on Cletus being the main problem here, we have to add it to the list. Always make sure you don't leave any space goop behind, especially not in prison. Come on, Venom, who do you think's gonna grab it? Number five, became a werewolf. This version of Spidey appears in Marvel Zombies Army of Darkness Volume One. He doesn't really have a large role or anything, but being transformed into a werewolf has gotta be a new low for Spidey. In the comic, we see him with big old wolf ears and, a, and big hairy arms ripping out of his costume, and it is not lit. Can you imagine werewolf Spider-Man swinging through the moonlit sky chasing you down to eat you? Yikes. The werewolf web slinger and his fellow superhero werewolves ravage the world and eat Galactus, later chasing after Ashley Williams when he appears in this universe. Number four, killed Uncle Ben. On Earth 2301, better known as Marvel's Mangaverse, we see Ben Parker part of the Spider Clan. He's skilled and ambitious, and he even plans to open his own martial arts school. How badass is that? So during this time, he was teaching a young Peter Parker the ways of the Spider Clan. When one day Peter was rushing to avoid being late to the dojo, he was surprised to see all the lights were off. Huh, weird. I wonder if there's like a surprise party or something, or maybe Venom's here. Huh, let's hope it's the first one. With his last words being, with great power comes great responsibility, he died at the hands of Venom. There's a nice scene later on where the two talk again, and Uncle Ben gives the advice needed to Peter in this dreamlike sequence. It's beautiful. But the damage Venom did on this earth was permanent. And sad too, quite sad. Number three, director of Hammer. During Dark Reign, we see Norman Osborn basically become the head of what ends up being the S.H.I.E.L.D. replacement. Due to the fact that he eliminated the Skrull Queen, he gets to take over and creates his own agency called Hammer, an acronym that doesn't initially stand for, well, anything, actually. It was just picked because Osborn thought it was cool. As the director of Hammer, Osborn also took it upon himself to put together his own Avenger team, with him as the leader, Iron Patriot. Being a villain himself, you can guess what kind of people he called on to assemble his Avengers team, more villains, and some really confused and tormented heroes like Sentry. This was a really dark time in Marvel's history as Norman Osborn used all this power to do all sorts of awful stuff, all under the guise or in the often false name of heroic reasoning. Number two, Anne Wayne. Anne first met Eddie Brock at Empire State University. She made her comic book debut back in Amazing Spider-Man issue 375. She reflects on how once upon a time her and Eddie were in love. That's right, he was smart, witty, with a boyish charm that swept her off her feet. So what happened? Well, while they were married, Eddie became a journalist for the Daily Globe, and she was a lawyer. So far, sounds great. Sounds like a lovely household with people doing great work. After she divorced him, uh, things only got worse for her. Like, for example, I don't know, she was shot by the villain Sin Eater. Yeah. And then after that, Eddie figured it's a good idea to loan her some of the symbiote to heal her up. Now it worked, but the only downside is now we have a she-venom for a bit. She ended up ending the lives of two men who attacked her, so once the symbiote was returned to Eddie, she had to live with all of those memories. Unlike Lee, who had time to kind of erase and forget and just trick his mind into believing he didn't do these horrible things, Anne had this for like a hot minute and then it went away while she was an adult. She's like, I, I know what happened and it doesn't work out well for her. She was traumatized until the end of her life. She couldn't even leave her own apartment. Even for such a short amount of time, Venom can cause quite stress levels. Number one, planetary attack. In Venom Space Knight issue eight, the symbiote teaches Flash Thompson a lesson about its past. Back to where it all began. Back to where the first host was born. Yeah, so after the two had bonded, he went back to his homeworld and took out everybody. Now all the remains are just graves of the dead. Venom describes this first host as a cruel and twisted soul, one who showed Venom the cruelty and twistedness of his own soul. He killed everybody on this planet, so naturally I have to put him at number one.